wonderful. It's already been, yeah, a wonderful discussion. So I'm really excited and looking forward to it. So uh, can, uh, can you all hear me well? Yes. Wonderful. Um, yeah, first of all, I just would like to thank Yun Fan for organizing such a such a historical event, <laughs> as you uh, said. I think it's wonderful to have uh, people from so many different backgrounds, and I am uh, not a scholar, but a, a native speaker of one of the regions and have been really interested in uh, the area of language documentation and revitalization. So I will first do a short introduction because uh, today's talk is going to be about me <laughs> and myself. Uh, so uh, my name is Ayelha. In Tibetan, you call Ayelha, which means uh, turquoise goddess. And I am from Aba Sichuan, and the county is Zamtang. In Chinese, is Zhangtang. It it borders uh, with uh, Jintuan County, if uh, if you are familiar with the geography. But I will show a map later. I'm currently living in Chengdu, and it's been super hot here. <laughs> it's like almost 40 Celsius uh, every day. So uh, trying to have my brain working. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, as a, so today's topic is about my three roles in this uh, uh, language revitalization journey that I took on uh, around my high school age. So first, I am a native speaker of one of the uh, uh, Jarong kingdoms or the king um, that uh, she mentioned is Choskya so a native speaker of Choskya, and also a linguistic student and a dedicated and uh, pretty determined uh, language advocate. Um, so, so this is a brief agenda of my talk today. And uh, if you have anything that you just think of now, you don't really have to wait for me to the end. I think that's generally how I prefer, but uh, if you prefer to wait till the end also, that's fine. Uh, first, I will just uh, briefly introduce each of the roles. Uh, and I think that lays the foundation for how these three different roles are interconnected and how they are related. And through some interesting stories, uh, and I will explain uh, each different role in um, more details. And these roles um, that I have, sometimes they contradict and some, sometimes they complement. Uh, so it's just kind of my thought process. So I appreciate um, if you have input about how you would approach certain things or you as also a native speaker of uh, one of the dialect or languages and how ever you would approach different things. So my first hat uh, as, a, as a native speaker of Choskyav, um, and Choskyav is uh, written in this way in IPA, in uh, Latin orthography and uh, in Tibetan script. Uh, and as you can see on this map, it's generally um, where the where the red dot is. Uh, and I was born and raised in a village of uh, 500 people. Uh, grew up as a sheep herder, <laughs> not a really good one. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, the population of this language is uh, estimated about 10,000, which is a pretty old data. So uh, we're looking for uh, like renewing or recollecting the actual number of the uh, speakers. And uh, some language contact in the region, uh, first is Amdo Tibetan. Amdo Tibetan uh, is uh, in the local actually uh, in, uh, environment. We don't really say Amdo or um, Troskev. We just say Ronsket and the uh, Dasket, which is basically means nomad's tongue versus like farmer's tongue or something like that. And then we have the uh, Southwestern Mandarin and then Putonghua is uh, the medium um, of, uh, 
like in language of instruction at school. And uh, first, um, my kind of turning point, how I got into engage into the linguistic, uh, how do I got engaged to be a linguistic student? It was around high school age. I didn't want to go to high school. So I went to an English training program where I was conducting some uh, uh, field work back in my village, which I will explain a little more later. And I got to meet someone who has linguistic background and uh, she was teaching me IPA. And it was my first time seeing IPA charts. And that really, she told me I could use this tool to write out my language. And I was writing out, as you can see at the bottom, uh, writing out some proverbs, um, collecting tongue twisters, a lot of interesting oral cultures and uh, seeing uh, my own language like really written and visible. It was a really in, empowering and a really different experience as a, someone from just the oral culture and all the languages, written languages that I see are uh, written Tibetan, which we can't really write our dialect and then written Chinese. We also can't really write our uh, dialect. So I, all of a sudden I was like, wow, I want to learn more about linguistics and I want to pursue uh, this path. So that was the first turning point of me kind of making a really bold decision, uh, traveling to US um, and studying linguistics for a village like this small the villagers were like, you're, you're crazy and you're insane. <laughs> and at, this, at the time, actually, I also didn't really know much about linguistics. I just say, oh, I'm going to study about languages. And I didn't know what linguistics encompasses. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. So this is like a foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, okay, ta-da, this is uh, the part where I felt uh, for, uh, as the initial, you know, the excitement of uh, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do something exotic, something great. As the initial, you know, excitement wears off, I was like, wow, linguistics is hard. It's really hardcore. It's like a science. And I didn't expect that at all. And remember vividly, we were like me measuring those all different like vowel qualities and like consonants, like frequencies. And I was like, wow, this is, this is crazy. So I, <laughs> to summarize, I was really struggling. I was like, I'm more of a, uh, what do you say? Like I can grasp a general concept pretty fast, but like small details, I'm not like super great. So I was really struggling with the course and I, I started question myself, why did, I, why did I decide to study linguistics? Why did I travel half of the globe to go to US and uh, um, pursue linguistics? So as I was struggling, I was talking to my advisors um, about my struggles and uh, he, set up weekly meetings. Uh, this is Scott Delancey that was, uh, was my advisor. He uh, set up weekly meetings where I would write a piece of a description, like a grammar piece description of my language and meet with him and talk to him about my language. And that really, like, uh, really helped me to gain my confidence and gain my kind of focus back and then re-accessing like, why did I, study linguistics and why did I um, do this? Um, so as with Yunfan as well, we uh, went to attend uh, some international conferences. At the time, uh, I wasn't, like I, I didn't have a lot of linguistic knowledge even till this point. I, my linguistic knowledge is very, very basic, uh, but uh, kind of going to see these people and talking to these people about my language and how fascinated they are kind of regained, I regained uh, some of the confidence and the, the, the initial spark that I had for studying linguistics. 
So the third hat, uh, the third role is um, language documentation journey that I pursue. As I was telling earlier, in this English training program after my high school that I joined, we did these uh, quote unquote, I shouldn't say homework, but we would go back home with a recorder and a camera. So we would interview people and ask them to tell a folk tale or a tongue twister or riddle. And this homework initially was, it was kind of, first of all, I treated as a homework, but then later as I learned more about how much I don't know about my own culture and how much I am ignorant about my culture, I got really like, I wanted to learn more and uh, so that I can, first of all, go back to uh, the English training program, te uh, tell my teachers about these amazing stories that I hear. So this, through this process, uh, as an example, I was, I found out that the village name, uh, uh, the village name is Suyovu, which basically means uh, like, a, like a millstone. So where you would melt, like you would uh, sharpen your like uh, not millstone. What do you, do you call it? like you where you would sharpen your uh, uh, swords? So uh, the villagers, the legend is oh the king Gesar came to the village and that's where he and his soldiers um, sharpened uh, the sword. So that's got the village name. And I found out more story like this, and I felt a sense of like self-finding and self-making through this process. And uh, later I pursued it like further, I made uh, uh, mother tongue like short video clips, which if we have time later when I finish, I can show you one of those uh, mother tongue uh, videos. And uh, I soon realized first when I went in there, I was really went in as an outsider, went in as a, like a, I think I enjoyed it actually. I was like, oh, this is fun. Like I'm acting like a, someone like, oh, from outside interviewing people. But as I was doing it more, I actually really immersed myself into it. And I would forget, or I would intentionally not turning on the recorders. And it would be actually at some point it felt weird as an insider going into my community and like, hey, hey, tell me a story or like uh, uh, while well, they wanted to like talk to me about how my study goes and uh, they want to gossip, uh, gossip about like village uh, events or things that are happening in the village. So I soon, sometimes I would just not turn on my recorder and just really enjoy those moments. So this is a kind of a brief um, introduction of some of the highlights of each roles that I'm engaged in. So now I will tell uh, three short stories and how these uh, three different roles kind of uh, play out in uh, one another. So the first scenario or the first incident uh, was when I finished my undergrad at University of Oregon in linguistics, uh, my advisor said, do you, like, do you have the plan and do you have the will to uh, stay and uh, do graduate school? And eventually what that means is you will be working on a grammar book. And uh, I was really excited, first of all, um, because I think, yeah, that's very valuable. But then as I pulled down a little bit. Uh, first of all, I think, to be honest, uh, being away from home for so long, I was a bit homesick. So there's absolutely like emotional uh, uh, things involved. Uh, but second of all, I <laughs> remember this moment so vividly. I was sitting in Scott Delance's office and I see these really big, giant, thick, grammar book sitting on his shelf and I was imagining okay in seven eight years I will be maybe producing something like that which is is great but the villagers won't even know 
I did this and I won't, like they won't be able to read, um, they won't be able to access it. So I, I made a decision. I was like, no, I, I think I um, just would like to go home at that point. And also, as I was mentioning, when I was attending the conferences, one of the touching moments was hearing the Native American and the Aboriginal communities, um, their story about um, their language revitalization. It gave me a sense of like urgency. And it, I just feel like I saw this, my community's fate in like maybe 50 years or 100 years. So I was like, no, I need to go home and do something about it like right now, rather than sitting in a classroom um, working on a grammar. So this was the, the first incident. And then the second incident, it's kind of funny. It kind of was a little relevant to the first talk. Uh, I get this question a lot. They will say, so do you think Yarong is a dialect of Tibetan or it's a different language? And I get this question asked by Tibetans a lot of the times, especially when they hear that I studied linguistics and uh, I'm interested in language documentation. So they would ask me this question first. Um, do you have any guesses how I would respond or how you would respond to this question? I don't know, we, have, we do have a lot of linguists um, or anyone. You wanna give a shot? Anyone? Uh, I'm not a linguist, but I would like to say this is a question I met in my field work. Uh, actually, a lot of it's very controversial. Yeah, but most of the I have to say most of the male that I met as a <laughs> local elite they really believe Yarong is a dialect of Tibetan, and they explain to me. Um, several times what uh, what are their difference and what are their similarities uh, but I really want to to hear from a uh, local females <laughs> opinion <laughs> because uh, frankly speaking uh, when I speak with some women they they don't uh, have ad they don't use to speak their opinion they, mm. they don't think their opinion matters Sometimes I, I have this kind of impression. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the authority or the the voice most often you hear is definitely male dominant in the, especially in this context. And uh, yeah, as an insider, actually, as you pointed out, this is actually a really difficult question. And uh, I think first a few in incident like first a few encounters I just kind of really didn't answer or rug like put it under the rug and so like I don't know talk about the weather or like something like that but soon enough I had to like I really had to give a response and uh, uh, something that I, I said did the Yojing have, have a uh, have a comment or a question? Yeah, yeah I, I do have something. Uh, I mean, there's something I'd like to share because I, because uh, throughout the almost 20 years in the Jarong area, I could actually see that the viewpoints have been changing. Like right now, I mean, uh, there are more people who um, believe or who would like to think that Jarong is a dialect of Tibetan. And but um, I, re I vividly remember, like in about 10 years ago, um, when I was working with a uh, with a, a language teacher who spoke, who's a native, who, who's a native speaker of um, like really, I mean, a real Tibetan dialect um, spoken in Zorke. I was working with him and he is married to, uh, uh, I mean, his wife is a Jarong speaker, is a, a, a speaker of Sutu Jarong. And I remember at a point, I was I, I I actually asked him whether he could understand what his wife was talking about, 
And um, he was saying something like, nah, there's no way for me to understand his, uh, that their language. So that was his response at that time. But um, I remember I brought up the same question about two years ago. And we now have, we can communicate through WeChat at this point. So um, I actually, um, cause now we're confronting, we were having, we're being asked this question so much. So I, since I remember what he was saying years ago, so I would like to uh, check again, uh, what he's thinking about the Jaron language. So I asked him, um, so do you think Jaron is an independent language or is it a dialect? Of of uh, Tibetan, and he he like quickly responded saying, "Of course, it's a dialect of Tibetan." Although, and that's I'm I'm like, but you said he couldn't understand what they're talking about, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, that's true, but um, there are many elements that um that uh, that uh, there are many old Tibetan elements that are preserved." in uh, the Jarong dialect of Tibetan. <laughs> so you can see this switching of viewpoints throughout the past um, 10 or, yes, yeah, especially throughout the past 10 to 15 years, you can see that people are actually changing their viewpoints. That's um, yeah. what I'd like to share. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of similar to our first talk. It really echoes with this, I think, uh, because like, at, like there's the, the problem of ethnicity and uh, okay. there's a problem of uh, <laughs> like everything else around it. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. it, for me, I, as a linguistic student, I would, especially if I was talking to like Tibetan scholars who have some linguistic ba background, I was kind of really patient at the beginning. I would kind of explain a little bit of the difference in grammatical structures and all of that. And uh, of course, the two most important criteria for defining language versus uh, dialect, at least for linguists, is the first is uh, all the grammatical features, right? And then second is, uh, is it mutually in intelligible? Uh, in, in the mutual intelligibility is a, is a main factor. So I would just kind of like, oh, this is how we say things. And in Yaro, I would give some sentences, but then uh, like, I mean, Yaro has so many different varieties. I should, I should reframe myself using language or dialect, but it's so many varieties. And some scholars, just Tibetan scholars, just go there and pick Tibetan words. And they're like, look, how it's not Tibetan. Yeah, look at all these even basic words are Tibetan, um, which in my variant, is, it's, it's not, it's not even a cognate. So they would be like, oh, your is, yours is some uh, different, like weird uh, variant. And so let's just talk about the, the, the standard, the Sutu or the, like the main Yarong language, not the anything else um, type. So um, yeah, I think through, the, through this process, it made me sometimes patient and kind of trying to see different angles as an insider, trying to be a little more patient rather than just really giving a, even ignoring it. Uh, at some point, I mean, I have this WeChat blog, so sometimes I ignore it, but sometimes I can't. Uh, so I try really hard to, um, to give an answer and it being this position is kind of a, it's like a blessing and also a curse. Cause I mean, people are maybe sometimes genuinely interested and sometimes they just wanna give you a hard time. Uh, but all in all, I think something that I feel, I strongly feel is when we think about these kind of questions, uh, defining language versus dialect, those uh, sociolinguistic factors such as like how people themselves want, like how they want to be defined, how they want to define this language as a dialect and history and connecting all these, I think is very important in this, um, in this case. Uh, can I oh. intervene here just? Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if um, one way that might um, uh, make more people understand the, 
the degree of difference there is between Yarong languages and Tibetan might be um, to have more uh, uh, written documents in Yarong languages, but written using Tibetan script. You see what I mean? Because yeah. this way it becomes immediately visible. Uh, I mean, the, the, the degree of difference becomes more visible. And uh, so for instance, having entire, not just, you know, um, uh, small text, but entire books written in, in Tibetan script, uh, for instance, in, in Trostyap or in other Garang languages. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you guys know uh, the, uh, what's his name? The older Tibetan scholar, I, I forget. Now on Suchim. Yeah, on Suchim. He has been, he initiated, he initiated the, like uh, this project in uh, based in um, Barkam, which they produce these grammar, uh, not grammar, language textbook. teaching materials uh, like textbooks. But uh, I mean, he obviously has a really like he has a really predefined agenda. So all the things that he picks, even in the examples, even in everything, is like you can. It's either Tibetan cognates or Tibetan loan words, or the, even the way how they write sentences is like very <laughs> leaning towards like just aligning with the bigger narrative about like, hey, we're like not that much different uh, from Tibetan. So absolutely, I think having a different version of this is uh, going to contribute to this uh, dialogue a lot. So I've been um, designing my um, orthography for a long time. It's a it's a it's an ongoing process. Uh, so hopefully, in the next a few months, I can finalize and see how this goes and if this will contribute uh, to something that you mentioned. Yeah, Yu Jing has a comment. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Because um. Well, the 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 work of Awan Chuchen. Well, right now, um, my situ, uh, my Zhokje speaker, Zhokje teacher, um, Yang Dongfang, he has been. Well, I remember last year when we came here, he was actually very enthusiastic about all these, like, he, the, you know, these uh, textbook and materials that was prepared by Awan Chuchen. And this year, um, I saw that he was actually, um. Working on his uh, working on his wardrobe materials, like dancing and singing materials, and using Tibetan scripts as well. And I was like, why don't you have? Why don't you ask Professor Awan Chuchung to take a look at it? And and his response was like, well, he he his native uh, his native tongue is Zenla, and um, mine's Jokse. They're different, so that's why I can't really um, make out. <laughs> what these materials are about. So um, that, that was actually his, um, his feedback on the materials. So it's um, just like you said, he intentionally, he does have an agenda of showing that Jarong is exactly the same or is really a, a dialect of Tibetan. But while at the same time, if some Jarong speaker trying uh, to learn to read Tibetan and to read the materials, they find that it's, it's, um, it, it just doesn't represent their, their mother tongue. So that's, um, that's actually the case. So I was, I was just, yeah. So it's, it's a good, it's a, actually a good idea that you're preparing materials um, that are going to be represented in, in, in Tibetan script. And I think that will, that would be something for, uh, Tibetan speakers who can read Tibetan, and then if they read the materials, they will figure out that these are actually really different speech forms. Yeah, awesome. I mean the orthography design is intentionally uh, a pretty uh, different from the standard. Uh, besides, it's based on the alpha Tibetan alphabet. It's designed to be pretty different. So it initially, I think the implementation stage and uh, accepting it i don't know how that will go but uh yes stay tuned i will keep you updated of our, mm -hmm. or maybe i will need help on like i don't know advices or things like that going mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah okay so the last story is uh, as i kind of 
I mentioned, I've been maintaining a WeChat public account where I write like small, short uh, blogs. Uh, sometimes I share all those videos that I make. And the, one of the biggest like goal for this is creating uh, contents that are tailored towards more like general public and uh, kind of gain their interest into uh, the the linguistic the limited linguistic knowledge I have and kind of showcasing uh, uh, the language as uh, and I, this is a an album but I don't oh oh it works uh, there is a unified <laughs> giving a short a video of the different dialects of the uh, Chosyab so kind of really fun and like engaging general audience type of material. Uh, so I think I don't yeah I, I don't know if I'm going over time but I think this is the last slide so um, yeah as, a, as the conclusion slide so this is oh, I hear babies. <laughs> um, yeah I think as a native speaker and someone who's really um, wanting to do something that can help the communities maintain uh, maintain the language. And I already know, I think me saying this, like, gr like grammatical paradigms or sentence constructions are meaningless, is based on that I already know Yun Fan has been doing a, such a great job on describing my dialect, my tongue. Uh, so I feel like I have the uh, the energy or I have, I, I can set time aside and do something that I, I myself um, is really interested. And if I knew like the, I, there's no grammar exists or nothing of this language uh, like description, uh, description exists, then I have to go in and uh, have to be doing the uh, most important and the, the foundational work. Um, and throughout this process, Things that I've learned, uh, which I kind of also hinted, is I became kind of more accepting, acceptive or accepting of each each versions of myself, each uh, voices in my head, and uh, kind of trying to see from different perspectives. Even with long conversation with um, uh, Tibetan scholars, I try really hard to kind of not get emotional, but trying to see from their perspective as well. And through this process, yeah, I feel pretty empowered. So it's also a self-empowering um, journey for me as well. And uh, lastly, I feel as a kind of the overarching goal for even for this conference or this workshop is the, uh, the importance of uh, really um, connecting people from different fields, even having native speakers who are really like dedicated into studying linguistics and trying to take the initiation to do this kind of work themselves. Um, I think these are eventually really blurring the traditional uh, role of uh, linguistics, uh, linguists or traditional role of uh, like just speakers are just the uh, informants or like uh, you just ask, uh, ask some questions and that's it, that kind of type of thing. So I believe it, it, with this kind of work and this kind of workshop and this kind of talks and it's uh, blurring the, the, the traditional roles of these. And uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a brief uh, talk that I prepared. Hopefully, yeah, I didn't go over time too much. Okay, that's funny to your talk. Um, okay, that's a very enthusiastic talk. And yeah, um, yeah, please. And yeah, Jirha is one of the best individuals I've ever met. And we have, we've been working together for eight years and really to him, I'm very grateful. And questions, uh, Lijun, please. Yeah, <clears throat> I have a question. I'm, not, I'm a musician, not a linguistic. So maybe it's quite funny. The question is, I'm just thinking about the boundaries. When you think about the boundaries, when you want to sustain one culture, one language, 
and developed a script because I know actually the Miao language is like uh, commissioners. They went there, they make the language for the Miao people, read the language. So I'm thinking about the, the boundaries, to what extent we need to sustain and to what extent we actually can, need to categorize the, because, you know, my own problem that my previous project, I promised I learned two languages. One is the Miao, basic Miao, one is the basic Yi. But actually, I felt all like four years, I get all the information. But I only remember one Miao language is Bangana, that means hug a baby. That's the only language I learned, I mean, remembered. So, but uh, my, pr my current project, I, I promised were learn Yi, only one language. But actually, I found it difficult because Yi, they had a Yunnan, that Yi, and the Liangshan had Yi. And the Yunnan, the Yi, they so okay, Chushong is the mother place for the Yi uh, language. And then from this mountain to another mountain, they are all different. They couldn't understand each, each, with each other. So I just uh, feel quite confused if, like, I'm outside, I try to learn which language I should learn if they have so many subcategories. So what's your opinion? I would like to know. So next time I can save a bit of time to, to, to make that decision. <laughs> uh, okay, that's a really interesting and difficult question. <laughs> I think from the perspective of uh, language documentation or language re revitalization, I think each variant is worth, worth the attention and worth um, engaging and describing, right? Um, but if you're asking as an as an uh, as an outsider who just goes in and just uh, want to learn about a variant, it would probably really be pretty subjective. I don't think there's a guideline which one you should pick. Uh, a one that is accessible, the one that you have connection, um, uh, like actual human connection, because I think for uh, like doing whether that's linguistic work, whether that's uh, like anthropological work, the connection, the tr the trust, the building, the trust between you and the community is the key. So I would think if you already know someone from one of the Yi regions, I think that would be a that would be a first uh, first uh, like option for you. Uh, but I don't know from just purely from linguistic. Uh, perspective. I don't think there is, um, I mean, socially, there will be a lot of people who, uh, even in Tostia, they would say, oh, go, go study Wobzi, which is the very, uh, the variant that uh, the dialect that you study. study. Native speakers, they would say, oh, that one is the more standard one. I don't even know how they define that. It's probably some like uh, non-linguistic reasons, but they will say, oh, go study that one. <laughs> So I don't know if, uh, how much you should trust the locals on their suggestions as well. So if anyone else has any, any additional like comments on this, uh, please feel free to, to chime I think, in. Yeah, I think people just believe that, oh, my dialect is surely not the standard one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it happens to, to, to Chinese people. Um, in the Qing Dynasty or something, yeah. and foreigners came and wanted to learn their Mandarin. They say, "Oh no, my Mandarin is not that standard. Go, go to the north uh, and and find some standard variety." My suspicion is, you know, as if you went in as a linguist, they would know you will be asking tons of questions <laughs> and like wanting to elicit questions or like. Um, need a lot of time so please last question okay i would like to ask a question because uh the um actually the relationship between uh tibet and uh, the garong garong languages are very complicated and uh, so in schools, whether he, uh, nowadays in your area, how people, uh, because in my area, the people kind of refused, they don't pay any attention to learn Tibetan. Uh, you know, they told me that because the Tibetan that 
taught in school is Kamba, Kambagi. It's a mm. Kamba dialect. So it's not their dialect, not their language. So, and it's useless. So that's why in, in Damba County, uh, that's why the other Tibetan call them sinicized, uh, sinicized uh, Tibetan, sinicized uh, Gyarong. So how is uh, about your situation? How is the situation in your hometown? I see. Um, geographically, we're really close to close to Sesta Monastery. Do you know where that is? It's in uh, uh, Sesta. Sesta. Yeah. Sesta. Uh, Sesta. Oui. yeah. So what's been happening is, I mean, traditionally, or like in the in the like in history, people are literate in Tibetan in the sense that they read read scriptures like Tibetan. Uh, like a Buddhism scriptures, they chant mantras. So it's a lot of the elder people are, are literate in some sense, but like if you ask them to write something in Tibetan, they wouldn't be able to write it. But uh, a phenomenon that's been happening for the almost past uh, 10, I would say years is, so the Serta Monastery, they would send out monks each winter right before the new year to uh, volunteer and teach Tibet, uh, to teach the local uh, community how to read, write, and um, memorize these. I don't, I don't know if you have seen these uh, uh, new diction, uh, dictionary books. So yes. it encompasses anything like uh, uh, that you would need loan words for it. So anything that are out of vocabulary. Like cell phones, so, television, Yeah, computer. like coffee, yeah. like tomato. My mom would say, oh, tonight we are making a dum gong gong tang, which is xi hong shi dan tang. What are we making? Like all of a sudden I would be like, I don't know what she's saying because she would like, she got, she hands these medals each, um, End of the each session usually usually is one month. They teach one month um, the villagers Tibetan and recite all these dictionary entries, and then they do uh, the exams. Whoever scores high, they get you know uh, different medals like gold and silver and rounds. So my mom has a, a, like a section in our home where she hangs all her medals, and she's just really proud and. She, I, yeah, she just tried to show off in front of me. So it, the general, I mean, the I think the picture is a pretty different from uh, from Damba. So you, you mean, uh, but for the students, most of them are elder people like your mother, not the young people. The young people are sent to school, right? So our county is in Zamtang, which is Rangtang County. So we do have one uh, middle school is Tibetan and Chinese medium. So they have Tibetan as a language. And used to be they would teach like chemistry, physics, and uh, uh, some subject in, uh, in uh, Tibetan. But I think now is only they have it as a, as a language. Oh, it's uh, more like a Ando dialect or yeah. in school. Okay. Okay. Thank you.